Hi, Bronco. Hi, Robert. How's it going? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of Non-Zero Newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. You're Bronco Marcia Teach. If that's Very good. close to a correct, but thank you. Thank you. I good, practice good for hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, you write a lot for Jacobin, somewhat mm -hmm. uh, for other places, mainly Jacobin, mainly, well, largely about foreign policy. Uh, uh, especially since I guess the Ukraine war has, uh, has kind of focused your attention on that. Uh, yeah. I, so I'm a, I'm a staff writer at Jacobin. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think I've always written about, you know, foreign policy, war, civil liberties and that kind of thing, but occasionally, you know, I do some other stuff. I wrote a thing about inflation actually just today that, that will be going up tomorrow. So, you know, I delve into other topics. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk mainly about Ukraine foreign policy today. I think you also have a book on Joe Biden, right? <laughs> that's right. Yes. Is it a flatter? Uh, is it a flattering portrait? It's about what a great career he's had and what a, what, how perfect he is for this particular moment. No, I mean it was uh, my my uh, editor at the time uh, 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 correctly predicted that he was probably going to be the nominee, and so he wanted to have a book out there. And I had written all these pieces already on his history, so he kind of gave me the leeway to do an entire deep dive into his his record. And it wasn't it wasn't too good. Um, his presidency is kind of. Surprised me in some ways, and in other ways, depressingly reinforced mm -hmm. uh, what I thought was going to happen. Now, we should say, if there's anybody out there who's not aware of what Jacobin is, that it's a socialist periodical. Um, so uh, a super flattering portrait of Joe Biden might not be expected <laughs> from a, a Jacobin writer. Um, but but I, I would also like to, I, I do want to get into kind of the socialist take on foreign policy uh, generically, if it's possible to talk about that eventually. But why don't we start out uh, uh, talking about Ukraine? A lot's going on. Uh, Ukraine has begun the long-awaited counteroffensive. Uh, within the last 24 hours, a dam burst uh, up upriver from uh, upstream from Kherson. And I don't think it's been definitively established that it was blown up. Uh, that's the best bet, of course. Uh, but I think the early videos circulating were were fake of an actual videotaped explosion. Um, and uh, Russia is saying Ukraine did it. Ukraine is saying Russia did it. Uh, I haven't had time. I've been offline for the last five hours driving, and uh, I haven't had time to... Uh, form an opinion, and I doubt I would have had enough information, even if I had spent the last five hours, to form a, a good opinion on who is the more likely culprit. Have you been Have you been uh, paying much attention to this? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I would say that we can't say at this point who did it definitively because, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, the different sides putting fingers at each other. I mean, what I will say is one of the things that I – have been dismayed by, as I as I always am whenever an incident like this happens, is that, um, you know, of course, Kiev blames Russia, uh, and then you sort of get this rush of, um, you know, uh, uh, Western officials, Western commentators, so on and so forth, basically accepting that as fact and running with it. And, I mean, at, at the start of the war, I could, to some extent, understand why that was the case, because obviously, you know, the Russian government lies about all sorts of things all the time, um, and, and they have continu continued to do so throughout the war. Um, however, I mean, in the last, over the last year, uh, we've seen, you know, Ukraine repeatedly uh, accuse Russia of all manner of things, including, you know, bombing its own bridge in Crimea, um, of um, attacking <laughs> its own government building, the Kremlin, um, of, of uh, killing those two Polish farmers, um, uh, which could have started World War III. Uh, now this this was the case where a missile landed, and it w turned out to be an errant Ukrainian anti-aircraft missile, but Ukraine very quickly asserted with confidence that it was a Russian missile, right? That's correct. And every time one of these things happens, the same kind of army of commentators and officials basically just immediately says, yep, that's, that's exactly what happened. And then we find out you know, um, a week or two weeks later or, or a month later that, that, no, it was what you would expect. It was Ukraine attacking a Russian target because, of course, why would Russia attack its own target in the same, you know, Nord Stream? Why would Russia attack its own pipeline? Um, and similar to this, I mean, my understanding is that Russia actually controlled this dam. Now, that doesn't mean that it, it, the Russian forces didn't do this. 
Um, but I think it does mean that we should maybe just pump the brakes a little bit and, and you know, not rush the judgment, not uh, accept Kiev's accusations as, as uh, uh, you know, a civil facts. In the same way that we wouldn't just assume anything that the Kremlin was saying as, as, as being civil fact. Yeah. A similar question arises as arose in the Nord Stream pipeline is if, if they already control it, why would they need to blow it up? There's an easier way to, to uh, shut down a pipeline if you control the switches than blowing it up. Um, and all the evidence that's come out, including, uh, I, I gather, a Washington Post piece I haven't really read uh, today, but indicates that uh, actually, no, uh, contrary to, to some very, very uh, common Western reporting right after it happened, uh, it was not. It was not Russia that blew up its own pipeline. Uh, looks as if it was, I guess, probably Ukraine. You've read the, you've read the Post piece, right? You've probably got a clearer take than I do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I I've been cautious to skeptical with some of the stuff that's come out um, about this because it, it, some of it seemed like a very kind of thin attempt to push back on the the Seymour Hirsch piece. Um, you know, and, and there was just U.S. officials saying we think someone you know some someone connected to the Ukrainian government did this, but uh, you know we don't really know, and it's hard to say, and all this is pretty. Uh, uh, unconfirmed, and you know, so it, it, some of the stuff that has come up previously, just kind of, I don't know, it, it, it wasn't quite to me uh, on the level. It wasn't enough to say, you know, uh, definitively either way. Um, this recent piece gives me a little more, um, or, or makes me a little more, makes me less hesitant. Let's put it that way to to start uh, accepting this because this actually came out of a um, the Discord leaks. Uh, so this is a. According to the Washington Post, anyway, you know they got this um, uh, file uh, from one of uh, the, the leaker's friends, and it, it has this um, uh, intelligence assessment that I believe uh, it was the U.S. U.S. intelligence that was given to Europe, or, or possibly the other other way around. But either way, it's it's them uh, having found out that that Ukraine had uh, plans to uh, blow up the pipeline. So you know, at that point, now there's actually something, some sort of hard. Uh, evidence behind this. This is not just sort of anonymous officials yeah. saying something. And you know, I mean, there was um, a previous uh, leak from the same same set of Discord leaks that uh, uh, you know Zelensky apparently was you know very angry at one point, and he uh, he talked about you know maybe we should blow up the gas pipeline that connects Hungary and Russia, you know, as a way to sort of um, I guess punish Orban for his stance in the war and maybe kind of. Uh, further sever whatever economic ties there are between uh, uh, Putin and some of the NATO governments. I mean, that obviously wasn't followed through on, but it showed that there was, you know, this kind of uh, talk, this, this this sort of conversation was in the ether, you know, in, in the Ukrainian uh, uh, leadership. So, you know, uh, again, I think we should still be cautious, but certainly suggest that this is not, you know, just a kind of uh, ridiculous theory that's being floated by, by the uh, US government to sort of take the heat off some of that, that Seymour Hirsch reporting. Yeah. The, uh, and, and in the case of the dam, um, I don't know. I, I, I quickly this morning kind of, uh, checked out the Washington Post, New York times, wall street journal. Um, and, and I thought, you know, the, the times and post just to read the first few sentences didn't do that bad a job of conveying that one side is saying one thing and one side is saying the other, uh, the Wall Street Journal, I, I don't think I can commend in the, in the same way. Uh, I mean, I've actually got the lead here. Um, the, uh, let's see, what is it? A major dam and power station in Russia occupied part of Ukraine were destroyed Tuesday, narrowing Ukraine's options for a planned counteroffensive in the south by unleashing a torrent of water that caused serious flooding. I've actually heard it both ways on, on that point alone. I mean, first of all, I had not seen much speculation that a big part of this offensive was some kind of river crossing from Kherson. Like doing a river crossing under artillery fire is nobody's idea of a good time. Like doing it in large numbers. I, I just hadn't seen that kind of speculation. And one effect of this flooding apparently is to flood the elaborately constructed uh, Russian retrenchments uh, on the so-called uh, left bank, which is to say the kind of southeast side. Um. And people think that Ukraine may exploit that eventually. There's the question of like, why, apparently this will jeopardize the water supply to Crimea. Well, obviously Russia doesn't want to do that. I, I, I don't know. There's just too many questions 
for uh, you know the, the journal piece, and then it just goes on, goes down the line, quoting people who who think Russia did it. And look, it may well have been Russia. It, it could have been. Uh, it's just that um, you know, and e even the even the 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 media outlets that kind of play a little straighter, the Western ones, they tend to lead with the Ukrainian half. You know, it's like Ukraine today accused Russia of of blah, and and that's. Uh, kind of the lead that's closer to objective reporting. Um, but I don't know it to me, the great frustration of this war is, is how hard it is to figure out what's going on mm -hmm. and how far from useful the Western media in particular, um, often is right. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think that, that that's one of the biggest issues here is we just don't, we are not getting a clear, picture and we never have i mean just as one example right so this counteroffensive is going on so i think it was two weeks ago the uh ukrainian presidential advisor top advisor let's go i've forgotten his name now he says it's in the ukrainian pravda he says you know the the counteroffensive has already begun okay now um they're fighting and apparently russia says that it has um uh repelled uh ukrainian forces in a couple of places um, now that same advisor is quoted in Politico and a bunch of other places, The Guardian I saw also saying, well, they couldn't have repelled anything because uh, the counteroffensive doesn't exist. It's not happening yet. Um, I mean, it was the same thing, the last counteroffensive back in whatever it was, August, September. Uh, uh, there, were, there were two, right? There was one in the, in the south and one in the east. And the, the one in the south, from all accounts, from, from the actual on-the-ground reporting, uh, was incredibly bloody. Uh, and, and, and destructive, and I mean, it was a complete disaster for the the, the, the people who were fighting there on the Ukrainian side. Um, but uh, uh, some Ukrainian officials, I remember the Guardian also uh, had an exclusive, put it an exclusive, uh, had a Ukrainian you know intelligence official or, or a special forces personnel uh, saying, uh, "Oh, this this counteroffensive that wasn't real. That that wasn't the, the southern one was just a feint. It was just us." drawing them away so that we can succeed in the East. It wasn't a real counteroffensive. But then mm -hmm. you read the Washington Post reporting on it, um, and it sounds very real to the, to the men who, you know, were just absolutely slaughtered and lost limbs and eyes and all kind of uh, horrible injuries down there. Um, and they very much were saying, no, this was a, very much a planned offensive. Which of those is true? I don't know. I suspect probably, you know, the, the, the latter one, that both were very serious offensives. But because we keep hearing completely contradictory messages and because the media, I think, as you say, has, for whatever reason, I have my own suspicions why, but for whatever reason, have completely abandoned this idea of actually trying to report on this objectively. Um, we, we don't know what's going on. And, and often we've gotten actually a, a more rosy picture. It's one of the things I wrote for wrote about for Responsible Statecraft. We get a rosier picture of the Ukrainian war effort than the actual you know, pretty brutal reality. And what is the effect of that? It, it makes us here in the West, who are far, far away from, from, you know, the front line, it makes us think, oh, yeah, great. We should keep keep fueling the war. We shouldn't look for the flag or turnovers because victory is right around the corner. We should keep supporting, sending these men to be slaughtered endlessly. Um, and I think uh, I, there should be a reckoning about this when it's all over. Um, whether it will, uh, I, I very much doubt it. <laughs> it didn't happen after the Iraqi uh, WMD debacle, so I don't think it'll happen here. Yeah, um, and I mean, I should say, you know, nations, uh, they always try to control information when they're in a war. So you should, you know, it's not some kind of indictment of the Ukrainian government to say that we can't trust them on this any more than we can trust the Russian government about what's going on. They both demonstrated that they will try to mislead us uh, and that's exactly what you would expect. And I think it's fairly common if you look at traditional American wars for the press to at least at least in unless sentiment turns dramatically against the wars, it finally did in Vietnam. You know, the press generally is supportive of the war, I would say. Certainly they were in World War II. And of course, America is in a sense part of this war. We, we are we are uh, we are supporting it big time. So I guess it's not surprising uh, that our media uh, is, you know, uh, uh, it seems to me clear, mainstream Western media, mainstream U.S. media is biased in favor of Ukraine in the reporting of the war, which is just to say that they accept a lot more at face value when it comes from the Ukrainian government than they do from the Russian government. And that's not the path to truth. Uh, 
uh, it, so it's not shocking at any level, but like, I would like to know, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's, I'm an American citizen. I'm involved in supporting this thing. It's a very complicated issue that we can, we can talk about. I, I do want to talk about, I do want to kind of flesh out how, how you kind of think about this whole thing, you know, kind of as a, as a Jacobin guy, like as a socialist, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. It's a very, it's a very complicated issue, but at a minimum, I would like a clear view of what's going on over there. And I think like the mainstream, the elite U.S. media is getting a little better. They're, 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 they're starting to see or acknowledge that maybe they, that, that you know, they, they, they uh, haven't been giving us a super objective view. We finally saw in the New York Times this week a piece about the kind of Nazi iconography that you see on Ukrainian uniforms sometimes. Uh, I wouldn't see call it the hardest hitting version of that you could have imagined, but it, it was there. That's something. Uh, but uh, still, I wish I could point to like a main, like anything, like CNN, mm. New York Times, anything that I could say they're really, you know, they're, they're really viewing themselves as journalists first and foremost and working mm. hard to see through the smoke. But I can't well, point to anyone. And what was one of the things we found out in that New York Times piece? It, you know, I think halfway down the piece, uh, we get a line telling us that uh, on occasion, Western reporters who have been there to photograph the soldiers actually have asked them to remove these obviously uh, Nazi insignia that they have in the uniform so they can take photos of them and send back. Now, that is deliberately deceptive. You know, and that, that is, I think it's totally fine to um, have an opinion a moral stance as war. I mean, I think any sensible person will look at what's happening and say Russia's in the wrong and that this war is an appalling crime. And it's, you know, it's, it's everyone involved in it, you know, in an in a ideal world um, should be prosecuted. That's, that's fine to have that opinion. But when you start to treat it as a, not as a, as a, a question of what is right and, and, and what is wrong and how do we kind of tailor our coverage around that, but you start to treat, treat it as a, as a sports, um, event where you're almost cheering for one side, um, for one side's war effort. And that you actually see a longer war as better for one side. I think that's where you start to depart from, you know, uh, simply having a kind of moral stance of what you're seeing and you start to actually lose any objectivity and, 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 and well, not neutrality, but certainly any, any attempt to kind of, as you say, report the actual truth. Yeah. Because the truth is important. If we, if we want to know how to actually end this war, I mean, this is kind of the, the problem with, you know, that I found writing about this, you know, I, I think the, the NATO expansion stuff, which everyone, you know, since uh, February 2022 has just said, oh, that's completely relevant. I think it's core to what's happening. And I think the reason why it's important is that it helps us to understand how we can, number one, how we could have prevented it. Number two, how we can get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's such a, um, a, a, a blanket of, of silence that's uh, both, you know, kind of uh, a deliberate and also I think out of fear. Um, that's been cast over anything that departs from the kind of, you know, standard narrative that we hear that, that I think we just kind of keep being laid down a, a, a more and more disastrous path. Yeah, the NATO issue is kind of obliquely related to the Nazi iconography piece. So, first of all, I thought the piece was good, uh, you, you know, pretty good. Uh, I, I applaud the guy for writing it. It's Thomas something Neff. I forget the byline of the New York Times. And he had run afoul, by the way, the Ukrainian government had like sanctioned him for some earlier piece they didn't they didn't like. Um, so, you know, he, he he's uh, he's doing more than most, I guess, to to challenge the narrative of, of both sides, which is what you should do. Um, but uh, and I thought, you know, it first of all, I thought it was valuable that it conveyed that, look, to some of the, the people embracing these icons, they don't mean the icons don't mean what you might think they mean. You know, it's a, they have a complicated history. Yes, they're associated with Nazism. And he brought up the example of the Confederate flag, which I think is a very good example. Like in high school, our arch rival was Robert E. Lee High School. They had a Confederate flag. And it is true that virtually none of these guys thought, like, this means I'm for slavery or anything. They just didn't think about it. I mean, mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and then there are people for whom it does mean you hate black people. And that's why they, there, there's different kinds of people who, who have, over the years, uh, wanted to associate themselves with a Confederate flag. And I'm sure this is the same way. And I, and the article did convey that look, subtly, I would say, but it, it said it, that there are still 
some people with actual neo-Nazi sympathies who have been of such service militarily, and this is wartime after all, and you can only be so picky about who your soldiers are, that, you know, they're still there in, 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 not in small numbers, even if the Ukrainian government is certainly not a Nazi government. My criticism of the piece is that it didn't mention this recent incursion, I don't think, into Russia by that was done by two groups of, uh, well, not just ethnic Russians, but people from Russia who now live in Ukraine. One of the groups is just flatly neo-Nazi, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. And their leader is a neo-Nazi. And their view, one thing they like about Ukraine is it's more ethnically pure than Russia. And they apparently, this one group, one of the two groups, uh, thinks that all of Russian uh, citizenry should, would ideally just be white. Okay. The, these guys are like neo-Nazis and the Ukrainian military apparently saw fit to give them a number of armored vehicles given to Ukraine by the U.S. under the understanding that they would be used by the U.S., by the Ukrainian military, and that they would not be used in cross-border incursions, much less used by neo-Nazis. Now, mm -hmm. to me, that raises a lot of troubling questions, the fact that this happened. I mean, either, you know, this seems to have been orchestrated within the, uh, the, the uh, military intelligence apparatus, okay? So either there's like real... Uh, neo-Nazi sympathy in there, or at a minimum, it doesn't really bother them, or things are out of control and major weapons are going to people that aren't under the control of the military. Like, this is troubling. And, and anyway, I thought that really belonged in this New York Times piece as an example of how, you know, however small the role of this actual heartfelt neo-Nazi neo ideology in overall Ukrainian affairs it's not nothing because that particular incursion, this is the NATO part, they're taking NATO issue vehicles to attack Russia and some of them are neo-Nazis. And remember, Putin's two big justifications to this war was Ukraine is doing NATO's business and NATO is arming it so that it will threaten Russian territory, A, and B, it's a bunch of neo-Nazis. It's like we're doing his propaganda work for him and I still have heard very little in the way of protestation from our government. Anyway, that's well, it. Well, I mean, you know, it wasn't just that. I mean, there have been several cases now. Uh, Italy was was one. I, I, there was another country, which I can't remember now, but but of um, far-right extremists who had plans that were foiled, you know, um, way before they got to the finish line or they came even close to, to, to the finish line. Um, but they had plans to carry out terrorist attacks in uh, Western Europe. And they, you know, in, in the, in the um, indictments against them, it's listed that, you know, they had connections to Azov, that they got some of their weaponry from Azov. You know, I mean, this is one of the concerns I kept raising at the very start of this when I said, you know, uh, maybe U.S. policy around trying to respond to this war shouldn't be about just flooding massive amounts of weaponry. Maybe there's something else more constructive that can be done to try and end, uh, end the war because the long-term effects, we know from, you know, uh, conflicts like, uh, like Libya, um, and, and so many others um, that you know when you when you send uh, weapons, particularly in, in a war zone, but also in, in a country you know that's already suffering from from uh, high levels of corruption, that those weapons don't just disappear when the war is over. They they go to different places and they can be uh, have a disastrous effect in in, in nearby uh, countries. I mean, the, you know, the arms from from Libya, of course, famously went on to, mm -hmm. to um, be used by the uh, the, the militants in Mali. Which then necessitated another Western intervention uh, into North Africa. Um, so you know. Uh, and by the way, that guy, the the, the leader of that um, uh, Russian neo-Nazi group that that made that incursion into Russia, uh, Denis Napustin, uh, I believe, uh, he actually wrote on Telegram, you know, soon after the war started, where basically he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it because he uses a lot of ugly language, but you know, uh, basically, you know, all you all you uh, grant eaters and gay people and feminists and all that, you know, in the West, you all hated us, you called us Nazis, you called us this and that. And now look at you, you're all trying to send us, you know, knit, knit um, socks for us and send us weapons. But we're not going to forget, we, we don't forget how you treat us and what you call us for years. Just because you're doing this uh, doesn't erase all that. So, you know, um, this whole idea that uh, there's, that, that, you know, not just that, that Ukraine isn't a, a Nazi country, which it obviously isn't, 
but that that means that there's absolutely no Nazis at all in the country, or that that the far right in Ukraine, which which you know, before 2022, it was a well acknowledged fact that there was a significant and well organized far right cohort in Ukraine. It was a very dangerous one mm -hmm. with very vast ambitions. That this simply just stopped existing as of I guess 2022 or 2021. I mean, it's completely absurd, and and you can hear it from the horse's mouth, who, who says. Quite rightly, this is absurd. Uh, you guys were demonizing us for years, and now, now apparently you love us. Um, but you know, it, it speaks to that that uh, topic we were just talking about, which is the kind of abandonment of actually trying to report the truth and just about sort of pushing an agenda. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I have a list, a Twitter list of, of 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 people, of Ukraine commenters and so on, and open source intelligence people, and. About half of them are pro-Russian and about half of them are pro-Ukrainian. And that's the only way I can figure out to try to get at anything like uh, the truth. And the one thing I can, I think, safely report from that list uh, is that whatever Ukrainian official you're, you were saying said offensive, what offensive? I mean, no, they, they did launch a significant uh, uh, part of the counteroffensive uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and not nearly all of it, not nearly, but I mean, this mm. it's qualitatively different from what they've been doing in preceding months it's clearly even if it's it's just uh, kind of a probing operation it was it was a non-trivial one and so far as i can tell it didn't make any big breakthrough i think it, it, there were apparently kind of five points of attack one of them succeeded for a while they took a village uh, a town of 5000 but then uh, i gather russia retook that i don't know but um and and of course you get russia to, to hear russia tell it uh, it's been a devastating failure. I mean, Russia says they, uh, I forget how many tanks and armored vehicles they say they destroyed. And I think they're saying there are more than 200 dead Ukrainians or something. I assume all that's an exaggeration, but um, it, it's, anyway, it seems to be underway. Hasn't yet had any kind of big breakthrough and you, would, you wouldn't necessarily expect that yet. Uh, there were pro-Russian people speculating that uh, blowing up the dam was a way to distract attention from the failure of the first Leg of the offensive. I don't know. That seems like uh, a lot of trouble to go to, to 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 change the subject. It succeeded, I guess. Um, if, if so, but um, so what do you have? Uh, how are you kind of? Uh, you're monitoring the offensive, I guess. Now that it's uh, started. I mean, first of all, are are you are you somebody who does monitor the battlefield stuff? Like, I'm ashamed to admit that I actually have a kind of interest in that stuff. My father's in the army. Maybe that's why. But I, I actually follow it at that level. Do you do you try to pay attention at that level to like? No, I honestly don't. Um, I mean, there are people who do, and the you know people who um, have experience in war who know their stuff. Um, and you know, I try to I try to read them. But I, uh, to me, the, the, given the flood of constant contradictory information about what's going on in the battlefield, uh, what. You know, a particular uh, battle means. I mean, you remember Bakhmut, right? Bakhmut was incredibly strategically important for um, a while. That was how it was reported to us when Ukraine uh, wasn't seen to be suing, doing so disastrously there. Then, when the Russians were on the verge of taking it, it was actually completely unimportant, uh, 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 you know, part of the country, and it didn't matter. You know, so there's the, the, this constant contradictory information. I, 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 you know, I look at the uh, constant developments, and I try to make sense politically of what's going on. In terms of the the battlefield, I usually just wait and see. I mean, and, you know, I I was hearing back in um, probably start of this year, uh, you know, hearing from some commentators, oh, you know, Russia's going to take back move. It's it's coming any day now, you know. Mm -hmm. And it took you know what three three four months later uh, for them to actually do it. So um, I just assume all the information I get. You know, I think it's it's worth reading people who. Uh, seem informed to to at least get some sense of what's going on, but but you know I try and take all that stuff with a with a grain of salt and and kind of focus on mm -hmm. the stuff that, that that I write about. So when you so you're not following the offensive in a, in a micro way in a kind of obsessive way, but you're paying attention to 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 big developments and how are you processing that? I mean it's a it's a weird it's a weird situation if you believe. Well, I, I assume you are concerned about the possible consequences 
of sudden overwhelming Ukrainian victory in terms of how Russia might respond, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, that's just a guess. What what is your what is your set of hopes and concerns as far as the offensive goes? I mean, every way that you slice it, 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 it this is bad, you know, because yes, if if Ukraine breaks through and, and Russia really collapses, you have the possibility that a nuke uh, gets used, whether uh, uh, on Ukraine or, or somewhere else. I mean, if it was used on Ukraine, that would be bad enough. But then you add on top of that the fact that, you know, we, we've heard um, reporting that, that the White House's response to that would be uh, to, to basically launch an attack in Russia and, and you know, uh, attack its forces, which would start with War Three, which could allude to a wider nuclear war. So that's catastrophic. On the other hand, you know, Russia overtaking Ukraine is catastrophic for a number of reasons. Um, you know, not just the, for what would happen to, to the people living in some of those um, uh, uh, Western Ukrainian uh, uh, parts, but also, I mean, that itself could lead to escalation because if Russia starts to overrun Ukraine, then everyone goes, well, we have to, we can't let this happen. We have to uh, uh, now join the war in earnest or do something to deter them from going further. So that could also end up in the same in the same place. And then, you know, I mean, what might be the best option, the best of a, a collection of horrific options is that this turns into a stalemate. Um, basically, a bunch of conscripts uh, lose their lives um, in brutal and, and pointless fighting. And then both sides go, you know what, we've had enough. Let's just let's just end this. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's sad to say that that is probably the the best of all these options. Um, but even that, you know, comes with its own risks. I mean, I think the longer this war goes on, every single day, every week, every month, the chances of something happening to turn this into not just a a regional war or you know a war just between two countries, but turn it into a war between um, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, NATO and Russia, and, or NATO and Russia and China, um, increases. I mean, I don't know if you saw that um, that that Discord leak. Uh, the Washington Post reported about it. But uh, you know, back last year there was this incident between a Russian plane and a, and a, a UK plane. And at the time, there, you know, the, the British Defense Minister went to, to Washington very hurriedly, and people were kind of like, "Oh, you know, this seems pretty serious." And they played. I said, "No, no, that's not what it's about. This is just a totally routine meeting." Well, we found out it wasn't a routine meeting because what actually happened was a Russian fighter jet fired at a, a British uh, a, a stealth plane um, and uh, because he, the pilot misunderstood the instructions he was getting and he thought, I meant to shoot this plane down and he fired. And the only reason that that Russian jet didn't blow up that British plane and kill, you know, I, I don't know how many it was, you know, a, a dozen or more NATO personnel, which could have potentially triggered um, a war between uh, NATO and, and Russia is just because of malfunction. Um, and there's been several other close calls like that. But I mean, you know, it, it's the longer this goes on, yep. even if it's even if it's just a stalemate, um, uh, we, we still have to fear the, 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 the um, possibility of things unraveling and going out of control. Yeah, every day there's a chance of something going, going catastrophically awry. And the what makes it so hard to to kind of root for anything at all to happen in a way is, you know, of course, on the one side, I hate to see Russia gain territory through an illegal invasion. So them winding up with any of the land they've taken is in that way bad. On the other hand, it seems pretty clear to me that if Ukraine succeeds in pushing them back very close to the the the, the borders of February of last year, even let alone the 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 Ukrainian borders as of 2013, um, you, the the chances of Putin doing something uh, pretty dramatic start rising appreciably, if not a tactical nuclear strike. I wonder if he'd uh, bomb a, su a supply line in Poland. At which case, at which point we have to decide: Are we serious about the NATO uh, collective security thing or not? And 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 this gets back to the responsibility of the U.S. press to report this, like accurately, give us a clear view of what's going on. Let, mm. let let let's face it: Ukraine would love to have NATO in this war. I don't blame them. Their country mm. was invaded. Of course, you want help. 
we very much don't want to be in this war and mm. not just out of purely selfish reasons, but, but because then it becomes a much wider, more generally catastrophic thing with a possibility of nuclear war still on the horizon. So the American interest is very strongly associated with a desire for not to get NATO involved. And that's why, you know, to get back to this incursion of Russian soil, when a bunch of neo-Nazis supported by the Ukrainian military take NATO-issued vehicles into Russia, I think our media should be making a bigger deal of that than they made. And I think our government should should uh, say something very explicit about it. They kind of sent some signals through leaks that they're kind of not happy, but... Um, I mean, I, I think it's the latest example of that, that we've seen um, a bunch of times now. I mean, if the if the reporting is to be to be believed, that you know the U.S. even though it, it has an enormous amount of leverage over the Ukrainian leadership um, and is really the main military backer. I mean, I think you know the the amount that Europe has sent in terms of military aid it, it dwarfs what the U.S. alone has sent. Um, yet, despite all this, it does not actually have. Um, full control of what the Ukrainian leadership does. And I, to be honest, I don't even think Zelensky has full control of what is going on in his government. Um, and that's a very scary thing because you're right. I mean, and one of the things that I think about is as the Ukrainian situation, if it does get more desperate, you know, if it looks like Russia, um, you know, might take a significant amount of land or, you know, um, even, even go to Kiev again, um, that they, in a moment of desperation, uh, you know, do something and, and allege something, and then everyone jumps on board because, well, have we seen in the past year any accusation against Russia is immediately believed or, or caution is thrown to the wind? People just go along with it. Um, that's a very dangerous situation to be in when you know there's a, there's a war going on. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's it's definitely something that weighs in my <laughs> in my mind. Um, yeah. You know, it's a it's a it's a very bad situation. I mean, we often talk about what what's going to happen now, what's going to happen next. You know, I, I, what I wish we talked about is, you know, I don't think this had to this war had to happen at all. I think this war could have been avoided. Um, and I think there's so much talk about Putin is this Hitler like madman. Um, this is all about just a land grab, so on and so forth. Um, and and you know, the, the U.S. policy for the past uh, uh, twenty years, if not you know. A, every decade after the Cold War has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on. All of that serves to obscure the fact that, that there actually were some proactive steps that could have been taken to stop this thing from happening in the first place, which would have been the best thing for the world, for Ukraine, um, for the US too. Um, and, and maybe there still are. Um, but, but again, it's, it's all, it all gets kind of swept under the rug so that we can, any policy that leads to de-escalation is kind of you know, thrown to the wayside. So what do you think the best chances were to avoid the war? What, what, what could we have done? I mean, you know, you could go back decades. Um, but if we want to talk about just right before the invasion, I mean, I, you know, uh, uh, there was a State Department official who openly said that, you know, when, when Russia made its kind of opening uh, 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 negotiating bid back in, I think it was December 2022, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with all those forces amassed, clearly making a threat, saying, negotiate with us or we're going to do something drastic. Um, and uh, the, the Biden administration refused to discuss uh, Ukraine's entry into NATO, um, which is, I'm sorry to tell everyone, but that is, uh, there, there's a lot of other things going on. It's not just that, but that is one of the most fundamental uh, 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 grievances, of not just Putin. Um, in fact, actually, if anything, it's, it's much more a grievance of, of everyone surrounding Putin. Mm -hmm. and who has been surrounding Putin for decades, and as uh, uh, of him, he was a latecomer to, to opposing NATO. But that is a fundamental grievance, um, and the refusal to negotiate over that meant that basically he was in a position where he either, you know, uh, he had to. Uh, well, he seemed to think he had to invade or not. I think you know there were steps if he wanted to escalate things without you know launching an idiotic and destructive war. He could have done, but but he he made the decision he did. Um, obviously, that's on him. But, you know, I mean, it, it's ridiculous to say that that the U.S. refusal, you know, when, when somebody's pointing a gun to someone's head saying, ah, we're not going to talk about it. You do what you want to do. I mean, I think that's that deserves um, some criticism and surely it deserves some reconsideration, some, some reflection on, on why we did that instead of trying to 
trying to find some some way to talk about. Yeah, the uh, the State Department official you're talking about is Derek Chollett, who is counselor to the uh, secretary uh, Secretary of State. It's a it's a position. I mean, he reports directly to Blinken, so it's a, it, it's important. He doesn't have a lot of operational control. But that was a case. I listened to that podcast where he said that right after it came out. This was a rare case where I think I. I was kind of the first person to get it out there on Twitter. And and mm. and if you listen to the podcast, what's really frustrating about it is so the host of the podcast, it's the War on the Rocks podcast. Uh, his name is, I think, Ryan something. He uh he's no pacifist, but he says he kind of is it's almost in disbelief. He says, You refuse to talk about it. And and Charlotte says. Yeah. And, and then Charlotte says something like, but look, I don't think this is a win for Russia. And what, what he means by that, they don't really dwell on it. But what he's saying is, hey, Russia's in a top, tough spot now, because this was like some months into the invasion. It, it was, well, I don't know how far, but it was far enough. You knew the invasion had not gone as planned. Putin had in some sense bitten off more than he had chewed. He, you know, he was in a bad place. And Charlotte was almost celebrating the thing as if this is some kind of simple zero sum game. As if there's no way this thing could wind up being, yes, bad for Putin and also bad for the whole world and yeah. also bad for the U.S. It seems to me it's already clear it is it is bad for, 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 for all kinds of parties. But it's just, I mean, if you want to get annoyed, go back and listen to that podcast. It's just because, I mean, maybe it sounds like I'm making too big a deal this, but it, this frame of mind is responsible for so much badness in the world. Like, oh, there are adversaries. So... Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's what you say if you view geopolitics or you know a, a world events wars as as a game of chess, uh, but not as a matter of you know life and death, as a as a matter of thousands, potentially millions of people losing their lives, which is really what what war is about. Um, and I mean, it, to me, it's also you know you say this guy's not a pacifist. I mean, one of the interesting things. I'm talking about the in, his interlocutor, yeah, yeah, yeah. by the way. Yeah, 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 interesting. yeah, yeah. Well, what's interesting to me is that it's it. Uh, one pattern throughout this whole thing has been that, that people who are uh, military officials um, or former military officials or, or intelligence officials, people who I usually think of as as you know, I, I'm, I'm very critical of when I write about because they they see the world in a, I think a very kind of yeah zero sum game in a very hawkish way, and yet they are far more seemingly attuned um to the risks here and, and about mm -hmm. the uh, the potential drawbacks of war you know it's, it's the civilian leadership it's biden tony blinken uh jake sullivan victoria newland you know all the think tank intellectuals mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so on and so forth. they're the ones who, who are so gung-ho and they want to you know forget about caution forget about restraint you know this is just a simple black and white issue and uh, you either you know for victory or defeat and you're either on the right side or the bad side it's um you know, it's quite a change, I think, from from what we, you know, I think in the Vietnam War, uh, usually as the, the military was far more hawkish and, and the civilian leadership that was kind of more restrained. So it's, it's, it's a strange turnaround. I guess that's true. But it, it has often been the case that the, the cautionary notes come from the military. I mean, they're the people who have to fight the wars. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of sad uh and it gets back to the the fact that like you know here we are right i don't see a happy ending uh, personally i mean i mean uh, something that any rational person would embrace is like a great thing um uh but uh maybe maybe that's well, just me no yeah, i mean it's uh it's very disparate to think about because you know uh one of the other things i've, I've written about is you know what the, the sort of western plans for post-war ukraine i mean you know i think people who sort of just started paying attention to this stuff um, when the war started, um, they, you know, their, their idea is just, you know, Russia invaded and Russia has been kind of meddling in Ukraine for, for years and decades. And, and now the U.S. is involved in trying to help them. And I mean, that's not, it's a very reductive way to think about what, what has actually happened. I mean, before, um, first of all, Russia and the West, uh, really mean the United States have been, as you know, deeply involved in Ukraine. And, and meddling in Ukraine and Ukrainian politics for, for decades. I mean, what was the impeachment of Trump about? It was over the fact that Biden got Ukraine's uh, prosecutor general fired. Um, you know, I mean, that, that I think really reflects the level of involvement that the U.S. has. But besides that, I mean, the U.S. was for years 
pushing you know policies that I oppose, neoliberal economic policies, having uh, Ukraine um, cut uh, uh, gas subsidies to, to homes that made heating heating people's homes in the winter cheaper, uh, uh, pushing them to privatize state assets, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, um, uh, Zelensky shortly before the war passed the law to to allow the the foreign ownership of of Ukrainian agricultural land, which is really the kind of you know one of the core bases of, of Ukrainian wealth or you know future Ukrainian prosperity. Um, and and that's that's what's on the agenda. You know, if if and when Ukraine survives this war and whatever settlement or whatever you know deal is made to to, to end it, um, you know, I, unfortunately the, the sad fact is it looks like what, what's being planned is just more of that kind of thing, just more privatization, more neoliberal policies that in most countries have just widened inequality and, and, and you know, led to, to uh, uh, workers having less rights and, and all manner of other things. Um, and there's very little pushback about that because from the West, we only see it's, it's bad Russia invaded. And so that's the thing that we should oppose. We are, we're not being told about, hey, also there's actually things that our governments are doing that actually we have far more ability to influence and, 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 and prevent because there are governments. Um, uh, and we should do that. We're not being told about that. And uh, so there's, even once this war is over, I really fear that there's going to be, you know, um, years of more sorrow uh, for Ukraine um, after this. Oh, God, the, when you add up the, the deaths and the, and the people maimed and the, and the refugees, many of whom will never come back in any event, um, it's uh, horrible, and and you know the, the losses of the human losses on the Russian side uh, are not nothing either. I mean, most of these people are just, in some sense, hapless victims. You know, I mean they're they're, they're dead because of the country they were born in, and they they uh, um it's uh it's all pretty terrible. Um, you're you're starting to get into the, the what I want to ask you about the kind of socialist take on this. Before we go there, I just want to say. Something you said earlier about, like, you know, when I said, well, how could we have prevented the war? And you said, well, how far back do you want to go? I mean, that, that that's kind of very much my feeling. Like, I certainly don't know for sure that as of uh, December, it would have uh, been easy to keep Putin from invading. Uh, and of course, the question only gets more complex when you ask, like, what did Biden think of as being doable within a context of American domestic politics and how fearful is he of, of blob backlash and all that? But I do think just kind of the further back you go in history, like if you want to do a thought experiment where like, suppose I got to control U.S. foreign policy or at least policy toward Russia and, and, and Europe, like in that thought experiment, the further back you go, the more confident I am that I could have prevented this war. It's like uh, th there's a very complicated period in 2014, but 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 certainly the the the. the the mistakes begin with the expansion of NATO. It was just, and, and, and yeah, we don't need, we, we, you and I both, we agree on this. And everybody knows, I hope by now, that many sages in the US foreign policy establishment warned against expanding NATO. But what I've been surprised to learn since the war started by just doing research and like reading a couple of biographies of Putin is how many things we did in between then. And, and of course, in 2008, another big, moment where we pledge that Ukraine will eventually be part of Ukraine. That's a, a Bush administration initiative done against the 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 uh, very energetic advice of his uh, his uh, ambassador to Moscow, Bill Burns. Um, I, what I've been surprised on is between those two things, the initiation of NATO expansion in the 90s and this 2008, taking it a step, a decisive step further, just how many times we pissed Russia off. <laughs> for no good mm. reason, you know, yeah. uh, th there were just Putin wanted to be part of the West. It's as plain mm -hmm. as day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 Bush was just being a jerk. You know, he, yeah. he was under the influence of neocons. Plus, I guess he's just a jerk. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's like I, I. It was the unipolar moment, right? I mean, yeah, the, 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 we were the feeling our have to. Yeah, you didn't have to to worry about um, you know uh, uh, restraint and, and and balancing uh, you know your your actions against how it's going to affect other countries. That was the theory, anyway. I mean, and that's I think now uh, yeah we're sowing uh, 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 well sorry we're reaping uh, the results of that uh, mm -hmm. because yeah it turns out that a 
faded gray power with a huge chip on his shoulder that has <laughs> had a rise in nationalism for decades um, and already felt aggrieved because of a variety of things, um, including the economic crisis that, that, you know, was partly driven by the United States. Um, you know, there's only so many, so long you can sort of um, ignore its red lines and ignore its, you know, at least pretensions to be a great power before it does something drastic to, to show you, shows the, to, to, to prove it means business. Um, you know, I, I wrote this piece, uh, I went through all the, the WikiLeaks cables um, over a matter of, of, of years, I mean, years of WikiLeaks cables, probably took a few months. Um, and uh, what is striking about it is just how constant the warnings are, not just from Russian officials that you'd expect, like Lavrov and Putin and so on and so forth, but from other European leaders, um, from, you know, NATO allies, from uh, 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 intellectuals, from analysts in Russia, from Russian liberals, um, all these people constantly telling U.S. diplomats um, this Ukraine thing is a huge red line, the NATO expansion, people don't like it, it's not just Putin, it's, it's, it's the entire establishment, and if we keep going down this road, there's going to be a war. Um, I mean, they... they uh, they, they, some, some of these people really predicted exactly what was going to happen, and uh, you know, the, the U.S. response was, you know, I mean, certainly Biden's response going into, into that lead up into the invasion. He said, you know, I don't respect red lines. I don't, I don't listen to red lines. Um, well, we're seeing what happens when, when, you know, you don't do that. I mean, maybe that's just seen as a, uh, a success in, in Washington, but I mean, in, in, in Ukraine and Europe, I don't think, and certainly not in, in, in places like Africa, mm -hmm. where they're massively suffering from the secondhand um, effects of all this. They don't see this as a success. They see this as a complete um, disaster. And, you know, one, this is exactly why I watch some of the stuff that's happening with Taiwan and China and the U.S. posture there. And it's the same thing. We're not going to respect red lines. You know, apparently Xi Jinping told Biden Taiwan is a red line for us. Um, and you have to wonder, I mean, you know, for Russia, it took some number of decades before Putin decided to do this terrible thing um, in response to, to this, the encroachment on this red line. Um, you know, when, when is that going to happen with China? Um, you know, no, I hope not ever, but. But I think the other Ukraine Taiwan question is, um, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, Bill Burns, who, who was the ambassador to Moscow, uh, who warned against, uh, extending, uh, any kind of invitation to Ukraine to join NATO. Um, he's now the head of the CIA. So, of course, he can't go around saying, you know, you could have stopped this war, blah, blah, blah. Um, he said an interesting thing, even so, uh, in uh, in an interview that it, it, this got almost no attention. It went by very fast. I think Andrea Mitchell was the interviewer. I think it was at the Aspen, uh, Aspen uh, like six, eight, 10, 12 months ago. So I don't know. He said it wasn't so much Ukraine and NATO as NATO in Ukraine. And he said it quickly. And, and in elaborating, he said, he conveyed that he meant Ukraine, you know, being, uh, he, one thing he meant clearly was the de facto NATOization of Ukraine. The fact that whether you make it a member or not, we're sending a bunch of weapons. We're doing these training exercises. He, he's very explicit about this in his final pre-invasion speech. He spends a lot of time on this. And uh, how, look, you know, they can say it's not NATO. It's in, it's basically in NATO. And, uh, and Andrew Mitchell kind of steers him away from the point. He never kind of caps it, but he mentions national security. It's clearly uh, one of the things he means. And it raises the question, like the, the, the sending of the weapons to Ukraine, which was justified as a deterrent to invasion and began during the Trump administration, was it not an accelerant? Would, did Putin not look at that and say, well, look, if you're going to act, you better act now. There's going to be more weapons there tomorrow than there are today. And could the same thing happen in Taiwan? Good question. Mm. I, don't, I don't hear many people in foreign policy establishment even asking. No, for sure. Well, I mean, uh, um, I don't know if you read that Harper's piece um, about, about the war. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's, it, it's very good. There's many great things about it. But the, there's one particular um, part of it where they... Um, uh, there's, an, I think, an analyst who, you know, um, is contracted by or, or advises um, the Pentagon, um, uh, and he talks about, you know, talking to people about 
hey, you know, you have to think about how would we react if Russia or China, you know, put a military base or, you know, did <laughs> even half of what has been mm-hmm. being done in Ukraine for years in, in Mexico. And then apparently the response, you know, he says the response from the people he's talked to, they, they go, hmm, oh, yeah, no, we, we never thought about that. That's a good point. I mean, <laughs> amazing. Uh, and, and kind of scary that the people who are in charge of, <laughs> you know, the most powerful military um, in, in the entire world, probably in <laughs> human history, uh, uh, that kind of oblivious about just some of the most basic elements of, I guess, statecraft. You know, yeah. Yeah. Just the ability to look at things from the point of view, a point of view other than your own mm. and try to put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself how you would, you know, this is the, I think the most important mm. ingredient of good foreign policy. It seems to be almost totally lacking. Well, I wonder, you know, I, I've been thinking about, is this really a product of, of, Russian weakness. I mean, I know now everyone, everyone, it's very fashionable to say that, you know, Russia is this juggernaut that's going to, you know, planning to take over Europe and, you know, so on and so forth. And if not, if not, go even further. Um, but I mean, in reality, I think, I think people understand that Russia is not the Soviet Union. Um, mm-hmm. Because I mean, the, the idea that, that you would do this with the, you know, when the Soviet Union was around was completely unthinkable because of the fact that it was a, 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 you know, to you to use a, a phrase that is thrown around now, you know, a peer competitor was a, a country that was on the level of the United States roughly um, at the time, and Russia just isn't. And so I think there is, if it's not conscious, I think it must at least be subconscious there. This I uh, thought that you know we don't have to to, to think about um, uh, what Russia wants. It's too weak to do anything. We're the we're the big dog. And they just have to to get along. I think that's that was certainly what Bush's um, attitude was. Yep. And you know, for the most part, they're kind of right. I mean, I think we've seen first invasion; they're kind of right, but but uh, not completely because mm. even a a weakened uh, great power, um, even if it ends up doing profound damage to itself, as Russia has with this invasion, can still um, do some some very rash and terrible things. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a it's a it's a probably a pretty common failing of great powers and powerful people to not pay as much attention as they might to how other people view the world because they can kind of get away with stuff without doing that. But some presidents are better than others, and Bush's father was better than he was. In Bill Burns's uh, memoirs, he doesn't come out and say it. Uh, it's called the back channel. But clearly, I think he believes the first Bush administration was kind of the last time adults were in charge of American foreign policy. Uh, and they and they were against NATO expansion. They 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 fought off the neocon attempt to uh, to 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 initiate that. Uh, you know, this is in from 88 to 92. So, uh, look, we've been talking for almost an hour. Uh, something I've been doing on podcasts uh, lately is, you know, talk for about this long publicly. Uh and then um, go into overtime, which is uh, a part of the conversation available to paid subscribers of the uh, non-zero newsletter, um, whom I appreciate deeply because they they uh, allow us to keep doing this. It's easy to become one, assuming you have the money, uh, which isn't that much. Um, you can uh, just Google non-zero and Substack, uh, or uh, in the show notes, if you're listening on a podcast app, uh, there's a link. You can uh, go there. Uh, there will be a post that is this conversation, but moreover, at the at the top right of that post, you'll see uh, that there's a way to just set up a podcast feed that will always include these extended parts of the conversation. Anyway, Bronco, you've been kind enough to agree to sit around and talk a little more. I want I, I do want to get into this issue of like kind of a socialist take on foreign policy and how much overlap is there with other skeptics of American militarism, libertarians, kind of. Uh, conservative nationalist kind of, you know, Pat Buchanan type conservatives, where is the overlap? Where are the differences? Uh, and also I want to ask, like, is there any hope for changing the kind of perceived atmosphere of public opinion in America that would, that would have given a president Biden, if he were so inclined, uh, you know, a year and four months ago or whatever would have given him the kind of perceived leeway to negotiate with Russia without, you know, being called a coward by uh, a chorus of people on on cable TV channels and uh, in op-ed pages. All right. So that's what I want to talk about. So uh, anyway, thank you uh, for this much of the conversation. And thanks to people who listen to this but, but won't be with us uh, for the rest. Um, 
But now here comes the rest.